Good evening. Welcome to our first ophthalmology international grand round. And let's start with our first case with Pedro Franco. Welcome. You can start, start the presentation, please. Okay. Good evening. Can everyone hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. So good evening, everyone. My name is Pedro. I am a second year resident. Uh, it is a great honor to be here presenting to our Chinese friends and colleagues today. Uh, I will present a case from our uveitis division. My preceptor is Dr. Vivian Afonso, and the head of the sector is Dr. Luciana. So today I'll present a case about a 40-year-old patient, female, born in Sao Paulo. She's a store manager uh, who came to our service complaining of rapidly progressing painless visual loss for the past two months with no history of trauma. As for other signs and symptoms, she had a progressive weight loss. She lost 22 kilos in 10 months. She had adenophagia with whitish throat lesions, and she had a chronic diarrhea. For her past medical history, she had done a cholecystectomy 10 years ago, and she was also a heavy smoker. And her past ocular history and her past family history was unremarkable. Well, for her ophthalmic exam, um, her best vis corrected visual acuity in the right eye was light perception. Um, and in the left eye was 2020 vision. Her anterior biomicroscopy, she had normal eyelids and eyelashes, a clear conjunctiva and cornea, a deep anterior chamber with no anterior chamber reaction. She had a vitreous cells of one plus and she was phakic. For her left eye, she had normal eyelids and eyelashes, clear conjunctiva and cornea, deep interior chamber, and phakic. Her intraocular pressure for the right eye was eight uh, millimeters of mercury and left eye was 10. Her pupillary reflexes were reduced in the right eye and she had also a relative efferent uh, pupillary defect and her reflexes were normal for the left eye. Uh, when examining the extrinsic ocular movements, she was orthophoric in both eyes, and she and I'll show photos of the fundux exam. So, for the fundux exam, can I continue? Yes, please, Pedro. Okay, so in the retinography of the right eye, we see a clear media with a whitish yellow hemorrhagic central lesion over the optic disc. We can't see the optic disc in this image. Associated with retinal necrosis and intraretinal hemorrhages following the inferior nasal uh, retinal vasculature. So, um, here we can see a widescreen um, view, uh, a wide, wide field retinography of the right eye. We can see the extent of this lesion is actually really, really large lesion until the inferior nasal periphery. And for the left eye, we see a normal retinography. We see a pink optic disc with sharp margins, a cup to disc ratio of 0 0.3 with normal vessels and macula and an attached retina. Okay. So for our main hypothesis, can I continue? Would anyone like to ask a question or comment? No? This okay. is the uh, actual, actual days. Actual days. I'm sorry? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, this is actual days, just the, uh, at the uh, subretinal uh, space or the uh, edema of the retina. Yeah. If if they exudated, it, yeah, or... it seems to be it seems to be uh, an exudative lesion. Yes. Okay, exudative lesion. Oh. Yes. Okay, go on, please. 
Okay. So we have a 48 year old patient complaining of rapidly progressing unilateral visual loss. Um, she had also other um, suspicious uh, lesions such as whitish throat lesions, uh, chronic diarrhea. She had a very important weight loss in the last 10 months. And a fundix exam uh, revealing an hemorrhagic necrotizing retinitis without significant retritis. So first, when we think about the anatomical or syndromic diagnosis, we can think uh, it's a posterior uveitis, a retinitis. And when we think about the etiologic uh, diagno diagnosis, our first uh, guess would have to be cytomegalovirus or CMV retinitis. And in this case, we can also think about an immunodeficiency state, um, and due to its prevalence, maybe HIV AIDS disease associated. Okay, so when thinking about other infectious causes, we should also think about syphilis, tuberculosis, acute retinal necrosis, progressive outer retinal necrosis, and a typical toxoplasmosis and other CNS infections, such as neurocryptococcosis and others. Uh, we can think also about inflammatory causes, such as BC disease, sarcoidosis, and vasculitis associated with connective tissue disorders. And also, uh, we shouldn't exclude masquerade syndrome. Okay, so for the management, does anyone want to comment? Any third-year resident could answer the management? Glauco, Frederico. Hello, um, good evening. My name is Glauco, I'm a third year resident. Um, so we have this patient with the diagnostic hypothesis of um, um, CMV. Uh, so I would like to perform on laboratory tests to evaluate the, the patient's overall health immune system, um, also an HIV test. Um, I would uh, also ask for serologies, um, many syphilis, um, a PPD for tuberculosis, um, and uh, uh, cytomegalovirus. Uh, if it not, doesn't solve the, the main diagnosis, I would um, do um, vitreous step of vitreous biopsy um, just to to do the the immunology um, and also uh, I would treat him uh, at the hospital uh, and with uh, endovenous drugs uh, main gencyclovir. Okay, that's perfect. That's what we also thought. Um, so first, we must perform the laboratory exams to check our patient's overall health, as you said, Glauco. So uh, we ordered general exams. Uh, we also needed to check the patient's HIV status and the serologies. Um, when thinking about the biomolecular diagnosis, uh, it's true in, in atypical cases, in diagnostic challenging cases, we can think of vitreous step um, to, to further evaluate with polymerase chain reaction, uh, searching for the virus. Um, but in, in this case, uh, we could see that it was a fairly fairly um, classical presentation. So we, we didn't include this option in our management. Uh, when thinking about CMV antibodies, they don't usually help in, the, in these cases because if they're negative, they don't actually exclude the diagnosis. And if they're positive, um, we don't know if it's just previous exposure. So we don't usually rely on CMV antibodies for cases like this. Uh, and, Glauco, uh, just a minute. Uh, also, uh, can we, we can ask our Chinese friends uh, what their 
thinking about this case also, if they have something to add. Dr. Yan, any of the fellows and residents, you have something to add to the management of this patient? Yeah, Dr. Yu, do you have any uh, suggestion? Dr. Yu? Yes, I'm here. Uh, so uh, I think all this uh, lab tab and uh, virtuous tab uh, is okay for this patient currently. And if for me, uh, if uh, with the suspicions of the uh, viral in infectious necrosis, uh, retinitis, so I will also do the IV uh, antivirus in, in injection, just like this doctor uh, suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay. you. All right. Thank you for your input. So, uh, I, so, sorry, I, I also have a question. I'm a student from Tianjin Medical University, and uh, I just want to know that uh, what general examination did you do to, to elim eliminate other uh, different diagnoses that you mentioned in, in the last perfect. slides? All right. So, I'll show you our laboratory workup. So um, the HIV test uh, ended up positive with a extremely low CD4 lymphocyte count, 37 cells for cubic millimeter. Um, the CMV antibodies were negative, uh, IgM and IgG positive. So previous exposure at least. Uh, and the other test, and, and there I answer your question. Uh, we did syphilis test, which was negative. Uh, we also tested for hepatitis B and C, which was negative. And toxoplasmosis, IgM, and IgG were negative. Uh, and other, um, other tests, well, then we, we made the diagnosis of HIV. We called our friends from the infectious diseases department. And as Glauco said, we admitted the patient to our nursery and we started IV antiviral. We started gencyclovir uh, in the dosage of five millimeters per kilo uh, intravenous BID. And we also started highly active antiretroviral therapy. So our systemic investigation also included a chest CT and TST. So TST is tuberculin skin test. We also did a brain CT to search for uh, central nervous system infections and uh, intracranial hypertension and other types of lesion. We also did a lumbar puncture, upper GI endoscopy, and stool tests to, to evaluate the patient as a whole. Um, so in cases like this, we must have a multidisciplinary approach with the infectious disease specialists, with social services, and the mental health team. We shouldn't forget that we're dealing with uh, bad news uh, communication. So we have to have a very special approach to cases like this. Um, so our systemic investigation was positive for esophageal uh, monolysis and fungal diarrhea. It was negative for tuberculosis, cryptosporidiosis, and others opportuni other opportunistic infections. And... Um, the patient stayed uh, admitted to our nursery for 21 days uh, doing intravenous gencyclovir. So our follow-up plan for this patient then uh, is to continue the intravenous gencyclovir, but in day hospital. So the patient actually goes home and then returns to receive her, her medication in the maintenance dosage until the CD4 count is over 100 cells for three to six months. So this is very important. Uh, the, the treatment doesn't end when the patient uh, uh, leaves the hospital. It, it must continue for, for a long, long time. So the, the patient must be aware of the, the, the continuation of the treatment. We must continue with the antiretroviral anti uh, treatment and the patient will be continuing um, to, to be seen with the infectious diseases uh, out, outpatient clinic. And the patient must also perform toxoplasmosis and pneumocytosis prophylaxis because of the low CD4 count. 
So in the follow-up, a one month follow-up, we see, uh, we can actually see the optic disc now, uh, although it's still a very severe uh, retinitis. We see there's a vitreous hemorrhage. Uh, we see this um, very characteristic exudative um, lesions with hemorrhages, but it seems to be clearing up a little bit with the treatment. Here, a red free image of the fundix exam after one month. And well, after, after what we, we discussed, we could uh, think about a take home message when thinking about cases like this, that uh, well, CMV retinitis is a leading cause of vision loss in AIDS patients, but the introduction of antiretroviral therapy has significantly decreased its incidence and severity. Uh, the retinitis occurs most commonly in advanced AIDS patients with CD4T lymphocyte counts less than 50 cells per millimeter, uh, cubic millimeter. The diagnosis is mainly clinical, so we shouldn't wait the, for the biological, microbiological exams to start the treatment. Uh, although the, the vitreous step may help in the typical cases, and Again, the serology is not recommended for diagnosis. We shouldn't rely on it. The treatment should include, include the antiretroviral and the anti-CMV therapy, which can be admin, administered orally, intravenously, or via intravitreal drug injections or surgical implantation of a sustained release gencyclovir reservoir. Um, the effective treatment significantly decreases the incidence of vision loss and improves patient survival. The regular ophthalmic examination and close monitoring are necessary to detect and manage any complications such as immune recovery uveitis or retinal detachments. Uh, there is an estimation that one third of patients uh, with over 25% of retinal involvement can um, present with retinal detachments after the CMV retinitis infection. Uh, intravitreal gencyclovir injections may be a cost-effective strategy for treating CMV retinitis. The US Centers for Disease Control, or CDC, recommends that the CD4 count be at least 100 to 150 cells for three to six months before CMV therapy is discontinued. So we have to remember the maintenance treatment and the prevention of CMV retinitis with antiretroviral therapy and regular ophthalmic examinations is essential in AIDS patients. Last but not least, we should remember that these patients are highly complex patients with a very uh, complex social um, environment. So the multidisciplinary approach is crucial in order to ensure the best standard of care. So it should include infectious disease, psychiatry, social services, and primary care teams to, to give the patient uh, all the treatment he deserves, he or she deserves. All right. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, it was a pleasure to be <clears throat> here today. Thank you, Pedro. Any comment, Dr. Yang, Dr. Yu, yeah. any comment about the case? Okay, thank you so much for your wonderful case and uh, complete uh, examination of the treatment and the diagnosis and the reasons. So I have a question. Uh, we finally, we know the result, right? And when you uh, review this uh, case, do you think is there any problem of the history uh, with AIDS or, you know, the various uh, infection? Um, you know sorry. what I mean? You, you know what I mean? You, do you, do you lose the uh, history uh, for the uh, AIDS? Uh, this is a 38 year old female. She's got uh, JIA and has had recurrent uh, anterior intermediate uveitis in the left eye, uh, first diagnosed last year with like three flares since then. So um, okay. Uh, sorry, Professor. Uh, can you repeat the question, please? I, uh, I just want to ask you, you know, 
Do you, uh, is this patient uh, has the history with uh, AIDS? No, so um, this patient didn't actually know the diagnosis. Um, when we review her, her history, um, we see a lot of signs that she probably had this infection for a long time, but we, but for social reason, reasons, she she hadn't the diagnosis yet. Yeah. So when did this uh, patient? Did, yeah. Did this patient with uh, other uh, various uh, infection? Yes, she had uh, esophageal monolysis. She also had a fungal diarrhea. And is there any sign like a fever or no. the body pain? No, no she, nothing. Nothing, nothing. She only had the esophageal lesions and that diarrhea, and she had a very, very intense weight loss for the past okay. 10 months. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, any questions from uh, other uh, residents? Uh, I have a question. Um, uh, hi. Uh, Dr. Franco, uh, very good presentation. I have a question. Like for this patient, I noticed you use the intra, uh, intravenous antiviral treatment. Uh, have you ever tried the intravitreal uh, antiviral uh, injections for these patients? Uh, so we, which would you first choice, the intravitreal, uh, intravenous injection of uh, antiviral medicine or the intravenous? Well, well uh, this is a good question. Um, the intravenous uh, treatment is, is a lot more available in our service, uh, but, uh, and, and it's usually our first, our first choice, but um, I would also like to, to ask uh, Dr. Luciana and Dr. Vivian if they, um, if they usually perform the intravitreous injections also in our uveitis division? Lydia, are you here? Hello, hello, yes, I am. Uh, we usually to perform just go CCOV intravenous. And uh, for her, uh, she needed to be at a nursery. And uh, for us, it was more um, um, comfortable to use this, this medication intravenous. It's a possibility to do gancyclovir intra, intravitreous. Uh, some patients has no tropony and uh, the local uh, treatment is better for them but it's not the situation of our patient and uh, we would prefer to use intravenous for her. Okay, first, uh, Pedro, uh, congrats for your presentation. You made a good job, I'm so Thanks. proud of you. And can I, I, can I ask a question? Uh, Excuse me? Yes, go ahead, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Rodrigo, how are you? Uh, I have one question. Uh, what, uh, can you tell us the, what difference between the CMV and the HZV uh, in clinic? Because you, you know, uh, the both, of, both of the inverus induce retinal necrosis. So uh, we hope to know the difference between the CMV and the HZV induce the retina necrosis in clinic. Uh, okay, so I, I, I'm um, about your question. In zoster virus retinitis, the acute retinal necrosis, we have a circumferential uh, pattern of retinitis with a occlusive vasculitis. So it's something different of this presented case because here we have a, a nerve involvement and a, 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 an area, a diffuse area of retinal that crosses with hemorrhage, but we ha don't have the circumferential pattern that we usually have in zoster 
retinitis. And I usually say that we have some red flags in cases of uveitis. In this case, we see an important one, this alteration of the optic nerve, an important edema, signs of severe inflammation, and with a very, very low visual acuity. So this shows that we have a serious case here. And we probably here we have not just a, a risk of uh, sight, but we have a risk of life. So in this case, we have to be very aggressive in, in treatment and very aggressive in investigation. And I, I think that uh, uh, the first the first case the first thing we have to think in this case is that uh, probably this patient is in risk of life, and uh, she, she probably is very immunosuppressive. According to the local treatment, I think in this case, it's not a good idea because when you treat locally, we are just treating the affected eye. We need here systemic treatment to protect the other eye because the risk of the, the CMU retinitis in the contralateral eye is very high. So we don't think about, don't think local treatment is a good idea here. We need to be very aggressive and treat systemically. These, these okay, are thank you. You're welcome. Thank Let's you for coming. Let's move on. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. So next case, right? Uh, it's mine. This one's seven. Can you hear me? Can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay, nice. Yes. Okay. Um, just one second. Hi, the first participants. Okay, so my name is Pedro Guzman, I'm a secondary resident. My preceptor was Dr. Andrea Senra, and the head of the division is Dr. Roberto Bessani. Uh, I would like to give uh, some special thanks to Dr. Mariana Ikeda. So, our case of today is a 36-year-old female black patient living in Sao Paulo. She denied personal medical history or comorbidities uh, for her uh, past ophthalmological history. She had glaucoma, which was followed up in a external service. She had gone uh, undergone an uh, um, aridotomy in both eyes, and she was actually using X, which was a fixed combination of Timolo, Brimonidin and uh, bimatoprost in both eyes. She denied family history of glaucoma. So uh, she presented to us referring um, with a, a letter from the, the exter external healthcare service due to an intraocular pressure increase in the left eye. Uh, the ophthalmological uh, exam here. So she had a visual acuity of 20 to 20 in both eyes with correction for the anterior by microscopy. Ah, okay, she, she was uh, hyperopic uh, for the anterior by microscopy. She had for the right eye, clear conjunctiva, clear cornea, medium anterior chamber, which was shell in periphery. I am gonna show some pictures of it uh, with no anterior chamber reaction. She had uh, trophic iris with patent iridotomy and clear lens. Uh, the left eye was pretty similar with hyperemic conjunctiva, one plus of, of four plus, clear cornea, medium anterior chamber, with the same um, characteristics of the right eye with no anterior chamber reaction, trophic iris with patent iridotomy and clear lenses. The intraocular pressure with um, Goldman applanation tonometry at 2 p.m. was uh, 20 and 28 for the right and left eye. And then gonioscopy was closed, a position and angle 360 degrees in both eyes, with indentation up, open up to the posterior trabecular meshwork with double hub size sign. Trabecular pigmentation of two, two plus of four plus, and we're gonna show some pictures of it. So for the left eye, uh, as I told you before, we had a medium anterior chamber. In the periphery, we can see it's very shallow, and the, the iris is plain. Uh, another picture now evidentiated the, 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 the temporal side. 
the gonioscopy um, with double hump site. And in this case, we could see in the with indentation up to the posterior trabecular meshwork. And the retinography for the right eye had a pink obelisk with sharp margins, a cup to this ratio of about uh, 0 0.6, 0 0.7. And there was a little loss of uh, inferior rim. For the left eye, we had a pink up to disc with sharp margins, a uh, cup to disc ratio of 0 0.8, 0 0.9, uh, normal vessels and macula, and attached retina. Uh, we asked also for some complementary exams like uh, biometry. She had a uh, excel length of 21.28 and 21.48, so it, it's a hyperopic eye. The OCT showed us involvement in the retinal nerve fiber layer inferiorly and borderline change in temporal superior sector in the right eye uh, for the left eye. Uh, we had a more significant involvement affecting superior temporal and inferior sectors and the discs were symmetric. For the ganglion cells, uh, the analysis showed us the right eye with inferior arc weight reduction superior temporal and inferior quadrants, and the left eye showed diffuse reduction of the retinal ganglion cell layer. The visual field for the right eye, uh, we can see uh, a superior arcade and uh, a little bit of uh, central involvement, as we can see in the, the standard deviation here, the, the graphs below. And for the left eye, we have a complete arc weight and central involvement. This eye has advanced glaucoma. So for the diagnostic hypothesis, we, we thought of angle closure glaucoma in both eyes, as we could see the, the glaucomatose damage. And we had a patient with a uh, patent, uh, iridotomy in both eyes, which was pretty visible in the bimicroscopy and uh, showed no doubt for us of it. So for this case, we, we thought of plateau iris syndrome and for the management, uh, we discussed with the glaucoma service, the glaucoma section of our service. And for initial treatment, we saw pilocarpine 1% twice a day in both eyes. Uh, the patient returned two days later with this exam, the visual acuity was maintained for the, the anterior bio microscopy was also the same. And the intraocular pressure dropped from 20, 28 for 13 and 14 for the right and the left eye. Negonioscopy. We could show, we could see uh, pigment deposition anterior to the swabs line. The angle was visible up to the anterior half of trabecular meshwork without indentation. And one more picture. We asked also for uh, anterior segment optical coherence tomography and AS OCT, uh, which showed a shallow trabecular angle and, and uh, anteriorized plane iris. And the iridotomy was um, patent for both eyes, uh, which corroborates for our diagnosed hypothesis. So uh, for the management, the patient had a First, uh, good response to topical palocarpine, 1% twice a day. And she was satisfied with the clinical response. And because of that, we maintained with the initial strategy. So she uh, kept with the triple X and we kept the, the pilocarpine. And we asked her for to return in two weeks for reevaluation in our service. So two weeks later, she returned to us. Uh, complaining of headaches and night vision impairment, she presented to her service using pilocarpine once a day instead of twice. And this was her ophthalmological exam at this time. So visual acuity maintained, anterior bimicroscopy maintained as well, and the intraocular pressure now raised from 13-14 to 17-22 uh, in the right and left eye respectively. So, um, what happened in this case? 
we had first a good response to topical pilocarpine, 1% twice a day, but the patient showed adverse effects, headaches and night vision impairment. So what is our plan now? We maintain eye drops, we do an iridoplasty, or we do a phacomusification. Uh, we discuss again with all the glaucoma sector and the patient as well. And because of the adverse effects, clear lens and young age, we opted for argon laser peripheral iridoplasty. And of course, the left eye first. So we, we have done the procedure and these are some post-operative pictures for the left eye. Uh, here, not so evident, but in this next one, we had 20 spots, 400 uh, milliwatts for uh, half a second. If you look closer here, you, you can see peripherally uh, some dark spots here. I think it's more evident. So these are the argon laser spots. The gonioscopinal. Um, we, we can see after the, the, the iridoplasty, not in all quadrants, but main in some parts we could see now up to the posterior part of the trabecular meshwork instead of the anterior one. So the, the intraocular pressure now um, has dropped from 13 to uh, for 13 and 12. The patient was now uh, again using twice a day the pilocarpin after we um, discussed it with her and showed her the, the importance of the, the, the eye drop. And in the left eye, we could remove the, the pilocarpin. So she had just triple X and um, prednisolone acetate in this eye. We uh, asked as well for a ultrasound biomicroscopy, which showed us uh, as we looked in the gonioscopy, some uh, widening of the, the angle. So this one picture of the left eye, which we can see some uh, uh, iridoplasty spot and the wider angle there. This was the results. So reduced saturation to death for both eyes, patent iridotomy and identified sites of iridoplasty in the left eye. And as we already thought, lens interiorization related to the sclerospore, a lens vault of 1060 and 1040 and anterioration of the ciliar process. Now, uh, plateau years configuration for design. So this was the case until now. For the management, management uh, follow-up plan, we are programming uh, argon iridoplasty on the right eye. And until then, the, the patient will keep the, the pilocarpin 1% twice a day. We are maintaining the triple X and we're asking for new routine exam hormones. So retinography, OCT, and a new visual field, as she had um, severe glaucoma in the left eye. So for the discussion, plateau ear syndrome is um, a positional close angle with the flat iris configuration. The epidemiology is female from 30s to 50s, family history of angle closure glaucoma. Uh, the angle closure clinic shows even after the iridotomy, which is something we, uh, we, we, we saw, we, we have uh, seen in our case, the anterior chamber may not be necessarily shallow and may cause chronic angle closure glaucoma, as in our patient. So for the treatment, uh, just uh, passing through some uh, treatment options, pilocarpin has low cost, no surgical risk as it, it's a clinical treatment, but it has the risk of retinal, retinal detachment and may worsen the eyesight in the scotopic ambient for, because of the meiosis, may cause headaches and ocular surface symptoms, and the long-term use may lead to cataract formation. We had also the iridoplasty, which is a laser procedure and may cause uh, iris damage causing persistent mydriasis, which can cause photophobia or dyscoria. And the last choice, not so, um, still not so man, many evidence for this, but we could do a phacomusification with uh, intraocular lens implantation. Uh, we replace the natural lens with an IOL, which reduces the lens vault, deepens the anterior chamber, and opens the anterior chamber angle. But in cases 
like ours, it's controversial because the patient had clear lens and was young, which had a, a bigger risk of loss of foundation and risk of vitreous fraction and retinal detachment. So I would like to thank you all for the attention and that's all for now. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello, may I ask, ask a question? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, yes, I, I'm from Tianjin Medical University and uh, I noticed that this patient was uh, has a short axial lens uh, so have you uh, excluded any genetic disease or family disease? Sorry, I, I couldn't uh, understand your question. Could you please repeat? Um, I noticed that uh, this patient with a uh, short axial lens. Uh, yes. So have you have you excluded any uh, genetic disease? Genetic? Genetic uh, disease. Yeah, OK. We, we didn't uh, really search it for it because she has no uh, familiar history and she had no no other um, findings on her axon. Just the shallow anterior chamber, a low axon. Uh, she was hyperopic of plus two uh, spheric equivalent. Uh, we, we had not done a research because the patient was uh, had no more signs of uh, genetic disease. Okay, and no familiar history okay. as well. Hi, right, hello. Hi. Hi. I have a, one question. Hi. Right, yeah, thank please. you for your presentation. Uh, for this patient, I I mentioned that this patient suffered the uh, hyperopia. Hyperopia. Yes. Yeah. So, did you measure the eye axis lens for this patient? The actual uh, lens. Yeah. Oh yes, let me show you. And so how, how about the actual lens? Yeah, it was showed on the here. 2138, 2132. Mm. Okay, uh, yeah, yes. Um she had a refresh of almost normal. Uh, the lens of there. axis is almost uh, normal. Mm. Yeah, it's normal, yes. Yeah, it's not, okay. it's not a small eye. It's not a small eye. Uh. So I have a question. Do you try to, you, you know, you have used the uh, pillar cupping uh, uh, twice a day. Do you have tried to use uh, three times a day or four times a day and without laser treatment? Um, we didn't uh, continue with the pillar carpet because of the, the adverse effects of the patient. She was really claiming of headache and uh, the, the night vision she claimed as well, uh, said it was totally um, not, she was not dealing with it adequate, uh, adequately. Yeah, that's so, why we, uh, so and, uh, sorry, that's why we stopped bilocarpine because she, she really had a lot of headache and she didn't want to, to use bilocarpine anymore. And she tried to use just once but then the IOP um, increased again, and that's why we did the idoplasty. In okay. That case. Okay. So uh, you know, for this patient, you, you you see the optic nerve, the color is different, and the pop is different. So how to explain for this patient? It's different for the optic nerve. The pathological change. Sorry, I, I couldn't understand uh, fully the, the question. Okay, Could it be, you, you know, for, for, the, for, for this uh, case, it's a syndrome. Most of the syndrome, you know, the changes of optic nerve, uh, both of them are the same, almost the same. So however, when you see the ocular fundus, you can see the uh, optic uh, nerve, the cup, the ratio of the cup is different. One, the cup, cup is larger, another one is yes. smaller. Yes, well, yes. How to explain, uh, how to explain. Yeah, uh, actually the, the clinical case, uh, the patient was uh, accompanying in the in a external service. They were trying to uh, deal with it with um, triple X, but she just raised, uh, she was uh, referred to a service with just a uh, IOP uh, intraocular pressure raising uh, to 28, probably 
she had a, either a crisis, a crisis or just chronic angle closure in this eye. But yes, the, the left one was really more involved. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Any question? If there are no more, move to the next uh, case. Uh, Professor Yan, I, I, I just uh, okay. for this case, uh, the the petrol I have the, a confused question. You know, in for this patient in the future, what we should do? Perform surgery for the cataract, or still use the medicine to control control the eye uh, intraocular pressure? Yeah, because a good the, the the shallow the uh, the the lens contact the iris, maybe induce the pigment dropped into the anterior chamber. Maybe in future not good. Yeah. So yeah, because for me, I see. still confused. Yeah, pigment induced. Case. Pigment induced glaucoma. So uh, from this case, the examination they can find uh, pigment in anterior chamber angle. So for for you, how can you uh, decide? what we should do for this patient in the future. Mm -hmm. So for me, why I do not like to uh, do the uh, surgery first, because when you perform the surgery, you, you, you maybe, maybe, I'm not sure, maybe the pigment of the areas uh, dispersed anywhere is not uh, stable. So maybe uh, eye drops is better than uh, surgery. So I think, uh, Laser is a good option, maybe. And uh, combined with the use of uh, eye drops, maybe better. So however, however, I'm not sure. We should follow up this patient uh, frequently, you know. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm. I, I think conservative uh, uh, treatment is always the best one. <laughs> I don't, I dare not do the, uh, you know, very brave uh, surgeries. Okay, so let's right. move to next. All right. Thank you, Dr. Yan. All right, you, Dr. Rodrigo. Ruth. Congratulations for the presentation. Uh, now we're going to move to our Chinese presentations, right? Yeah. You moderate, please. Sure. You moderate. You're the boss. <laughs> okay. So the next one from... Uh, Tianyi Medical University General Hospital, the Department of Ophthalmology. Uh, Dr. Yu and Liu, who is the first? Uh, I'm the first, Professor Yan. Okay, Dr. Yu, show okay. us your slides. Okay, so uh, uh, I'm still in the office. Network is not very smooth here, so I will light up. Okay, it's almost uh, six o'clock, six o'clock in China. Six nineteen, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Dr. Like Yu has studied in the uh, USA, uh, is the uh, doctor uh, major in the uh, UVITs. Okay, please. Okay, I will show my pre recording, and after that, uh, we will have the discussion. Thank you. Good afternoon, dear Professor Rodrigo and your colleague in Brazil, and good morning to Professor Yan and all the audience in China. Uh, thank you, Professor Rodrigo and the Professor Yin. Thank you so much to give me this opportunity to show my cases here. And I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to take part in this grand round. Today, I will show my ocular recurrent chronic uveitis after penetrating eye injury in two cases. So here is the case one. It's a male patient, 43 years old. The cause of the injury is shooting iron bean belt with nail gun. And he has a medical history. Eight months after repair of penetrating in the right eye injury in local hospital. And the best corrected visual acuity was 20 to 25. And the other examinations only the ultrasound examination was performed in the local hospital and no intraocular foreign bodies were found. While in local area, no X-ray or CT examination was performed there. 
and after the operation, uh, during the follow-up, the vision acuity of the right eye decreased gradually with the intermittent right eye, eye pain, and photophobia. So they gave this patient the diagnosis of iris in the right eye and gave this patient repeated treatment and also not failed. The patient was hospitalized in our hospital there. So here is the patient's uh, examination. You can see the left eye is normal, while in the right eye, the vision, the corrected vision is only 2050. Pressure is still normal, it's 10. And the countdown tyrol, cellular hyperemia is there. And we can see here in the cornea, anterior chamber, the lens, and also the vision. That's there. The cornea has the dust like pigment KP. And anterior chamber have the pigmented flare and the cells. And also the lens, we can see brown yellow rust on the surface of the anterior capsule. And which is also have the brownish yellow opacity. Let's see the picture. So here the left picture shows the slit lamp examination and the and the operation uh, microscope in the right picture. You can see here large amount of the brown yellow rust on the surface of the anterior capsule of the lens. And the, the anterior lens uh, capsule is scattered with the white dot opacity and uneven opacity at the posterior capsule here. And we give this patient the examinations. The B ultrasonic examination showed the vitreous body was uneven opacity with no obvious foreign body. No LFB was found there. And also the UBM examination also showed no foreign body. And then we give the patient the X-ray and the CT examination. Well, in this picture, we can show that there were foreign body in the eyes. You can see here the X-ray examination and also the orbital CT examination were performed and the intraocular foreign body shadow can be seen. So since there is a foreign body in the ocular, uh, in the in the eye, we have to perform the surgery. So here is the surgical treatment uh, during the surgery. We can see the foreign body here. Uh, it's located in the past plana of the ciliary body, which is wrapped and organized around. The B, uh, picture B is the complete removal of the foreign body. You can see here, it's a very large foreign body. And the picture C is after the removal of the firm body. You can see here is where the firm body located. And after the laser photocopulation around the firm body hole and the organized part, here is the laser. Now I will show you the second case. It's also a male patient is 49 years old. The cause of the injury is striking iron and also have the muscular uh, history that patient 10 years old and want the repair of penetrative injury of the left eye in local hospital here you show i show you here is 10 years ago and the patient and the one fecal emulsification and the intraocular lens implantation five months after the injury due to uveitis and the lens opacity. So that is after the injury. And the no intraocular foreign body was found in the prior B ultrasound, the X ray, and the CT examination. So this case is not like case one. That patient only uh, underwent the ultrasound examination, then no X ray or CT examination was performed. But in this case, this patient, they have done all the examinations, including B ultrasound, X ray, and CT examination. Well, no obvious intraocular foreign body was found there. 
and the post-operative uh, follow-up this patient from six years ago of the life, I repeated have the right eye, eye pain, eye swelling, and blood vision. So also gave the patient a diagnosis of the uveitis in the left eye in local hospital and still have the recurrent attack after internal uh, uh, steroid eye drops treatment. Well, from three months ago, the symptom of the left eye became worse and accomplished with the elevated intraocular pressure pressure for one month and the steroid and antibiotic and also the anti glaucoma eye drops were ineffective. So he was transferred to our hospital. So here I show you the admission examination when the patient is hospitalized in our hospital. Now right eye is still uh, normal, uh, normal vision, normal pressure, no other obvious signs here. Uh, well in the left eye you can see the corrective vision, BCVA is light perception, and with the elevated intraocular pressure is 46. It's still on the antiglaucoma drops, and also uh, very obvious the uh, conjunctiva and ciliary hyperemia, the cornea epithelia edema, and also obvious flare and cells in the anterior chamber. And we can see there is a scar on the iris it's at the 10 o'clock could be seen in the center of the iris. And the pupil diameter is for no pupil reflection. And on the lens, we can see brown yellow rust pigmentation on the intraocular lens. And also the yellow brown ridges opacity is there. Not, uh, it, the fund is still normal. So uh, for this patient, we repeated the ultrasound and the UBM, X-ray, and CT examination after he was hospitalized in our hospital. While you can see here, still no foreign body. UBM, no foreign body. CT, X-ray, no foreign body. You can see here in the picture. Only a little bit of vitreous opacity, but no foreign body was found, was found no foreign body shadow. Well, since in this patient have the uh, penetrating eye ocular trauma, and also we can see the patient after the surgery have repeated uveitis and also have the elevated intraocular pressure. And also we can find some signs in the eye. There's some dust and the brown uh, pigmentation uh, in the anterior chamber and on the lens of the uh, intraocular lens uh, and in, also in the vitreous. So with the pictures of the intraocular form body in the eye, we performed the vitrectomy for this patient. And now we can see here in the surgical treatment, the foreign body can be seen here. It's in the past plana. Here is the foreign body in the left picture. And the rust deposition here can be seen around the cellular body. And the figure B showed the complete foreign body and the black residue on its surface. So it's a very old intraocular fracture. It's already 10 years. And after the operation, the two patients have recovered well with mild inflammatory reaction. In case one, the inflammation disappeared in two weeks. And in case two, the inflammation and intraocular pressure were controlled within two months. And the intraocular pressure in the second case increased again two years after the operation which was well controlled after the antiglaucoma eye drop treatment. And one year and two years after the follow-up, you can see stable, vision corrected, and with no obvious uveitis and no endophthalmitis, no retinal detachment, and the glaucoma will occur. So uh, I have shown you two cases of the uh, penetrating ocular trauma and after that have recurrent uh, uveitis 
I mean, the second case have also uh, complicated with the intraocular pressure elevation. So for penetrating ocular trauma, uh, is an important cause of the vision loss and may be associated with the existence of intraocular foreign body, LFB. LFB can be encountered in 18 to 45 percent of the open globe injury. And foreign bodies can cause mechanical and chemical injury if they contain iron or copper. However, the infection is still the most important risk of a retained foreign body. And up to 56 percent of the medical legal trauma cases are associated with the missed intraocular foreign bodies. Missed foreign body can present in different clinical aspects that may limit its detection. So the symptoms may only become obvious after a prolonged period of time. So in our previous study, we also reported a case of a missed a metallic intraocular foreign body over a 10 years period. With, uh, with causing chronic uveitis and uh, presented with a uh, second glaucoma later. So here is the patient that we have reported before. So this patient also had an uh, undetected intraocular body for 10 years. He was admitted to uh, several hospitals for vision impairment and intraocular inflammation three months. So you can see him. Uh, obvious penetrating ocular trauma and a um, missed uh, intraocular foreign body have damaged the patient's uh, vision function and the visual field. So the most important step for the diagnosis of intraocular foreign body is to obtain a detailed history of the patient, especially you know, in a child, maybe no obvious history can present. And for all patients here with open global injury, must be sure to ask for medical history in detail. It cannot be arbitrarily assumed that there is no fun. Certain entrance sites may be impossible to find, or radiological test may fail to find a small fun body. And imaging examinations should be performed in all patients with open globe injuries such as the x ray the AB ultrasound, CT, anterior segment OCT, etc. Especially CT and the ultrasound can determine whether there is a firm body in the eyeball and its location. And usually the combination of the two examinations can reduce the rate of missed diagnosis. Well, sometimes both ultrasound and CT failed to detect the foreign body. Just like case two I have present here uh, before the surgery, uh, not only the ultrasound, but also the X-ray and CT showed no foreign body shadow. So in case two, uh, even we have no signs, no shadow on the CT, on the X-ray, on the blood scan. Well, uh, due to the recurrent uveitis and the, the secondary glaucoma, the patients went to multiple hospitals for repeated drug treatment, and the patient showed signs of the ocular cirrhosis. So, for highly suspected intraocular foreign bodies, retracting is feasible to explore the intraocular foreign bodies. And the probable reason for the main diagnosis is the first one in the foreign body was tiny and located in the oral serenta. Therefore, both our beyond sound and CT could fail to detect the intraocular foreign body. And the second reason in the patient and one uh, cataract surgery after the injury in case two, but it's unknown when the foreign body was removed or not. So the history is not so obvious. And third reason in the patient have severe uveitis and the second grade glaucoma, which affected the diagnosis of intraocular foreign body. And for intraocular inflammation unresponsive to standard therapies, should arouse suspicions 
to the presence of uh, intraocular foreign body. Thank you all. Thank you for your attention. That's my case report. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, any uh, question from uh, Brazil uh, residents? Uh, thank you for presentation. I want to tell some comments and uh, do you think about the full field ERG for these cases, especially for the first one because of the long period of the foreign body and the size of the the foreign body. Do, do you think about the this this kind of tests for field DRG? So, uh, thank you for your comments. Okay. So, uh, uh, the case here, the first case, things uh, you know, uh, have the uh, history of uh, of where's penetrating ocular trauma, but uh, it's in a small town, and and there the just you know, only repair the eyeball, and uh, no extra examination like CT would perform. So that leads to the uh, missed intraocular pressure, uh, intraocular foreign body. So that's the reason it's um, not very complicated cases. Just you know, if, uh, in every uh, open globe uh, injury, we should perform all the examination to found if there is a foreign body in the eye. Well, for the second one, it's a different story. We performed everything, but we found nothing. Just uh, because of the, you know, the chronic uveitis and the, the history of ocular trauma, unexplained intraocular inflammation and elevated pressure. So we doubt with highly suspicious of the intraocular foreign body may be in the eyeball. So we performed the vitrectomy, but uh, before the vitrectomy, we still don't know if there is foreign body there. But when we do the surgery, uh, Professor Yen do this surgery, and uh, we found it's very tiny, smaller foreign body. So that's a uh, missed foreign body for 10 years. Okay, How was the final results, visual results of these cases? Uh, the first one, the vision is still very good. Uh, you know, the pressure is still very good. And the second one, uh, due to the long-term high pressure and the visual field defect, so the vision is still very poor. Even we removed the foreign body, the inflammation disappeared, and the pressure is normal. But the vision is still only uh, 20 to 200 because of the, the vision defect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Congratulations. Very good. Very good presentation. It's possible to make a comment, Dr. Juan? Yeah. Yeah, so I'll go ahead. Uh, Mauricio Maia yeah. here from the retina division. Uh, actually, I think these cases are very important. So congratulations to bring these cases here because this occult for anybody, uh, these are common. Uh, especially uh, when they are in the first plan and they are very small. So if the ultrasound is negative for the residents, I think uh, we should not forget about the high resolution CT and it's very important also the U UBM and also to see these patients again, because if you, high, if you have a high suspicions of the foreign body, only the ultrasound sometimes is unable to, to show it. And if you have uh, inflammations, like you see, uh, if you have doubts, go to the vitrectomy and FACO vitrectomy with a uh, fourth sclerotomy in order to go to the uh, far periphery of the vitreous, the vitreous base, and you are going to see these uh, small foreign bodies. Uh, which is very important. I like to, to, to do with these patients uh, the moxifloxacin for two weeks uh, after surgery. And uh, I'm very, very um, uh, worried about the siderosis that may be uh, occurring in these chronic cases. So that's the reason I think the Sungi's point, Professor Sungi's point, about the, the ERG is very important. So congratulations to bring these cases. These are very important cases. 
Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much. I give uh, very short comments for these two cases. Uh, you, you, you know, for the second one uh, case is the 10 year intracular foreign body. And uh, the reason why, uh, because, you know, uh, the uh, previous uh, doctors ignore the uh, intracular foreign body. So here I want to emphasize three points. The first point is for the primary emergency doctor or retractive doctor, when you check the patient, when ocular trauma patient, you should check is there any wound, even for the very fine smaller wound, they should have a wound. So for the second case, when you check the patient's cornea and areas, it's a very, very fine areas of wound. So the second case is my case. So why I, I can um, you know, find out is there any uh, intracular foreign body, fine intracular foreign body? Because when I check the areas, I found very, very fine areas of wound. So then when I perform this retractive surgery, I just try myself to check whether or not is there any uh, intracular foreign body at the peripheral area. This is a very, very important point. Means uh, check any, any uh, find wound uh, in the uh, intracular tissue. And the second one, uh, when you perform the retract surgery, you should check 360 uh, degree, means uh, all the peripheral area, whether or not there's some uh, intracular foreign body. And the third point, uh, I want to emphasize, if you know, you know, today there are a lot of residents online. So when you see the open globe injury patient, you should remember there are three points in your mind. In your mind, one is endophthalmitis. The second one is intracular foreign body. The third one is a sympathetic ophthalmia. Maybe. Uh, some of them, or both, uh, all of them occurred, maybe there are no occurred. Uh, however, you should re remember these three points. Thank you so much. Any question or any uh, comments? If there are no more, we move to the uh, next presentation. Okay, yes, let's move to the other question yeah. online. Uh, the, online? A, a doctor okay. asked a question online. Okay, okay. Can you see? Uh, how long does it that he, he ask? Okay, okay. He's asking okay. how long does okay. it it take for symptoms to start? Okay. The, the, the history, I, I mean, the, the history, uh, you know, when this patient, I, I'm not sure, when this patient to see me, uh, that's around 10 years, that's around 10 years. However, however, uh, however, maybe nine years, nine year and a half, nine year and a half, maybe, I'm not sure. Because this patient complained of the headache and, uh, you know, headache, uh, not comfortable, almost about nine and a half a year. Okay. I think that Professor, yeah, maybe this depend on the, the mental eye uh, concentration in the foreign body. Yep. Okay. If the high concentration of the, the eye, maybe uh, uh, develop the early. You mean the uh, contraction? Contraction? Yeah, the concentration yeah, of the eye. Okay. Con okay. Wait. Your voice is very you small. You, you, your voice. In Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Dr. Ho? Yes. Yes, okay. I, I, I heard. I hear it. Uh, uh, I think maybe if the mental eye of concentration very high, maybe induce the the uh, symptom very fast. If the concentration yeah. is lower, maybe a yeah. long time after. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Rodrigo, any question or comments? There are no more. We move to the last one. Huh? Uh, Dr. Liu, Dr. Liu, present please, your case. Okay, uh, let me share. Uh, 
Uh, so, uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, Brazil experts, and good morning, uh, Chinese experts. Uh, uh, first, I'd like to uh, say, like, I do appreciate the opportunity that Professor Rodrigo and Professor Nian uh, get to me to share a case I met in the clinic and help I can get some uh, suggestions for the uh, future uh, treatment for this kind of like patient. So uh, now I'm going to start with my uh, presentation. A case report of uh, bilateral central serous coronary uh, retinopathy. A 57 year old Chinese man who came to our clinic complained about his left eye. He had the gradual vision loss and could like shadow over a fetal field. Uh, the super, especially the super temporal and the subnasal for about two months. And he also had the photopsia. He has uh, the well controlled hypertension and no remarkable uh, allergic history or eye disease and no smoking. So, let's see his eye examination. Uh, for the right eye, the best vision acuity was one point and the left eye was 0.2. And he has mild opacity on the lens and vitreous. So for the father's image, the right eye was pretty normal, but for the left eye, we can see the inferior uh, retinal attachment and also the mild retinal attachment on the temporal side with macula uh, involved. And also for the auto lens angiograph, uh, what we see from the right eye, there's um, a very small part of the hypoflorence. Uh, but for the left eye, there are multiple areas of a hypoflorence. And we did the B ultrasound scan for him. For the left eye, there's very clear retinal detachment. And for the OCT, uh, for the right eye, we can see the dysregular pigment of uh, uh, RP. And for the left eye, the extensive subrational uh, fluid, uh, 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 especially with macula involved. And also we can see there are uh, a minor hyperfluorence, uh, hyperreflective uh, in the uh, subregional fluid. So we did a schedule a uh, Florence angiograph and ICG angiograph for this patient. What we say from the angiograph, uh, there are multiple uh, leakage points on the retina and with some staining of the subretinal fibrosis and also with the macula involved. On the IG, ICG angiograph, we can see the choroid vascular hyperbility and also with the staining of the pigment epithelium. And also on the uh, uh, temporal part and also the inferior part of the right here, there's some detachment. So what's the diagnosis and the, uh, sorry. What's the diagnosis and the differential diagnosis for this patients? Uh, he did have the retinal detachment. So it's the exotic retinal detachment or the retinal genus retinal detachment. We did not find any uh, visible retinal tear on these patients. So we uh, we intend to think like a patient patient have had the exotic retinal detachment. So what's the cause? Uh, first is the CSC. We recollected this patient's history. He had he said he had the history of CSC uh, several years ago, but uh, he was not treated. And also he had the typical signs uh, on the angiograph and he had the large retinal detachment. So what about the VKH? He had no obvious prodrome and no inflammation in the anterior ring chamber and uh, all the vitreous. And uh, he had no tumors tested on the B ultrasound. So we talked with the patients. So we tried to perform the laser for him, but it didn't work. So we treat him with the retractomy because the patient is a little bit aggressive about his uh, eye, eye, eye condition. 
So we treat him with the vitrectomy and uh, we found there are some uh, uh, subretinal fibrosis. We remove the uh, fibrosis and uh, try to do the silicon oil tamponade at the end of the surgery. So 10 days post surgeries for the right, for the left eye, the vision was improved a little bit and there are still some subretinal fluid left on the macular area with also uh, a, a part of like uh, the hyperreflective uh, in the subretinal uh, uh, in the subretinal uh, fluid. So we scheduled angiography again for him, and what we found there are still multiple uh, leakage points on the retina, but the most part of the retina was attached. So we talked to the patients. Uh, we performed laser for him now, and uh, after the laser. The subretinal fluid was gradually absorbed, but there are some macular atrophy left on the left eye and also some scarring from the latent in the macula. So the vision was not improved. And about several months later, patient came again for the right eye. He said he has the blood vision and metamorphosis for one week. So this time he came to the clinic very timely and the best, uh, best vision acuity for the right eye was 0.8 and for left eye was 0.3. Uh, let's go to the uh, fondus image. There are some subretinal fluid of the macula uh, area. So we scheduled the angiograph again for him uh, on the left eye, we can see there are multiple leakage points uh, on the retina and also the hyper, um, ability, hyper mobility on the choroid vascular. And also there are some staining of the uh, pigment epithelium. So here is the diagnosis for the uh, right eye. He has the acute CSC. Of uh, course, he has history and uh, also uh, the uh, typical signs on the angiograph and the neuroretinal detachment. Since the patient has the bilateral CSC, we did more lab workups for him. Uh, but for the ESR and blood routine and the syphilis and TB test and also the uh, glucose steroids test, however, none of them are uh, positive. And also we do some immunoglobin and a real mastic like a factors test for him and still no positive uh, results. So we decided to do the treatment for the eyes. Uh, we did the PDT, half dose PDT for these patients. And uh, after treatment, the subretinal fluid was gradually removed and absorbed. Uh, the best vision acuity go, uh, went back to 1.0. Uh, uh, and for the left eye, uh, there's no any uh, subretinal fluid, uh, a recurrent uh, subretinal fluid, but uh, the vision was not improved because uh, we can see uh, scarring of uh, formation the uh, macula and also it has the macular atrophy. So uh, we try to figure out why the patient has recurrent uh, CSC. So we look up some of the literature, they talk about the risk factors for the CSC. Uh, in this paper, they talk about the variety uh, risk factors for the CSC, uh, systemic uh, steroid use, pregnancy, alcohol use, antibiotic use, and autoimmune disease, untreated hypertension, or tobacco use. And also they, uh, um, they, they provide the multi-variety adjusted risk factors like diabetes, pregnancy, or the uh, systemic steroids use. But for other patients, he may have the hypertension on treat, uh, not well controlled for the second times. So maybe these are risk factors for him. Uh, also, this patient have a uh, bolus retinal detachment. It's not a common uh, CSC. So we try to find out like the characters for the bolus CSC. 
And in this paper, they talk about the characters. Uh, the average age was 54 years old, and the patients had the peripheral retinal non-perfusion and RPT and multiple PED, mm-hmm. and also retinal voids and subretinal uh, fibrin, and also hyper-reflectivity uh, around uh, large choroid vessels and at the level of the choroid capillaries on OCT. So here are the pictures that they uh, presented on this paper. In about 40 of the eyes, the peripheral non-perfusion uh, was evident at the site of the bolus retinal detachments, and a half demonstrated with the telangesia arising from the, uh, we can see from here, uh, from the channel capillaries within the area of the non-perfusion. And also they have the hyper-reflective latence at the levels of the uh, choroid capillaries. And also the bolus variety of CSAC uh, was, uh, uh, can present with the, the uh, increased subfovial choroid thickness. And they have two kinds of the PEDs uh, pres- uh, presented, uh, for one with the hyper-reflective of this part, and another one with the hyper-reflectivity, because there are some fibrin accumulated in this area. So what can we do with patients when they have the bolus retinal detachment? Uh, in this paper, they talk about the patients. They treat the patients with the medicine and also together with the laser and the PDT. Uh, after treatment, the subretinal fluid was removed and there are only minor subretinal fluid left. And what about surgery? So this patient, uh, was misdiagnosed with VKH and treated with glucosteroids. So the retinal detachment was increased. So patient was treated with uh, uh, the external drainage of the subretinal fluid. But after six weeks, uh, the subretinal fluid uh, was recurrent. So patient was treated with retractomy for both eyes. And after six weeks, of uh, uh, uh both of the retina were attached. But for the right eye, the vision was not improved because of the macular scarring formulated. But the left eye, the vision was quite good. So for the treatment of the bolus retinal detachment, so when is the non-surgical treatment we should perform, uh, we should do this treatment as early as possible. Uh, but for some of the patients, after the uh, stop the use of glucosteroid, most of the retinal detachment can rest loaded spontaneously. And if not rest uh, um, uh, absorbed, we can treat them with medicine. And also for later, it can give a rapid resolution of the uh, retinal, subretinal fluid. But if the patient has a very large area of leakage, so the extensive laser application may be not the best option because it can cause subsequent development of scotoma. So we can perform PDT for this patient. Uh, but uh, if the patients have the extensive retinal detachment and also uh, with the macula involved and the laser, we can't perform the laser, we can uh, perform the surgery for him, the external drainage. But when the patient has very subretinal fibrosis, the external drainage may not work well, so we can perform the vitrectomy for him. So when we see a patient in the clinic have the retinal detachment, we have to find out if he has the figure out if he has the recommended uh, genus uh, uh, retinal detachment or the exclusive retinal detachment or tractional. Uh, retinal detachment uh, cause uh, the cause will decide our treatment is the surgery or the uh, medicine or laser or PDT. That's what I want to share. That's all. Thank you for your listening. Okay. Any comments or question for uh, Dr. Uh, Liu? Dr. Leo, very, uh, I'm Kai Regatieri from Retina Sector. 
of Federal University of Sao Paulo. Uh, congratulations, very nice case. Uh, one question is, uh, could you do uh, before surgery on the left eye, could you do laser, thermal laser on the areas of leakage? Uh, we did try the laser, but uh, uh, since there are some uh, subretinal fluid and uh, 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 we could not do the laser sports. So that's why we moved to the surgery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good point. We uh, have uh, two cases of bolus uh, CSR. And if you don't have uh, subretinal fluid on the area of leakage, you could do laser or also micro pulse laser that we do we do a lot here in Brazil. Mm -hmm. So it's I think it was one of one option. But uh, the case that you show it that you have a reach uh, a lot of fluid on the on the subretinal space. So I think the surgery is the most appropriate uh, management on this case. Yeah, maybe the laser take a role. Uh, yeah, exactly, and the uh, subretinal. Uh, uh, leakage will be absorbed after laser treatment. Yeah, good, good suggestion. Yeah, depend on totally the uh, separation of fluid. Yeah, totally. Okay, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah Doctor Hu. Uh, yeah, um, uh, very good uh, cases. Uh, uh, previously, I used the laser uh, for treatment in this case, but uh, did you find some report? About anti VGF for this for okay. this case treatment. Yeah. So from your discussion, you didn't uh, discuss about uh, Doctor Liu. Do you, do you understand? Yeah. Uh, do you yeah, understand? Yeah, yeah. Do you I, catch? I, 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 yeah. Uh, I I I read some paper to talk about anti VGF treatments, but mostly uh, when it has the septory uh, CMV. They may choose the anti VEGF as a first choice. But for the patient with the leakage, like uh, the subretinal fluid, uh, mostly they, 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 they would like to use the uh, laser or PDT uh, as the first choice. Uh, uh, okay. Please. May, uh, may, I, may I make some points? Two points, please. Yeah, yeah please. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go on. So uh, congratulations to bring these cases out. So these are very important because there are a lot of residents here and uh, this Bulos uh, Center of Seros Coral Retinopathy uh, may uh, have two uh, important diagnoses as retinotogenous retinal detachment and uh, also the patients with Harada syndrome, as you pointed out very well. So this is very important. So I, I would like to, to, to mention uh, one, one basic thing that sometimes the response uh, for the diagnosis, the initial diagnosis is in the other eye. So I think the, the uh, ICG uh, um, uh, is very important. Uh, the ICG and geography is very important to be to we call um, hyperfluorescence, uh, which is a key point of these cases when you are in doubt about the the real diagnosis. So I think this is uh, this is an important point here that we should uh, mention. Uh, and uh, in these uh, atypical cases, I think uh, to be sure about the systemic intake of steroids or uh, the systemic diseases uh, producing uh, mineralocorticoid secretion, it's very important to be sure that uh, there is a source of this kind of uh, atypical cases. Yeah. So any comments? Dr. Hu? Rodrigo? No. Hey. Uh, yes, for the for the later treatment, uh, did you use the multi pulse laser for treatment, or ju just use regular laser? Uh, for uh, it's a regular laser. Okay. Regular la laser, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so uh, you know, for the, the say, say, is sometimes I... they use 
Uh, we can use multiple uh, laser. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, if there are no more questions, I think Dr. Hu and Rodrigo, the time is up, I think. We should, yes. we, we, we should yes. stop right here. Huh? Everybody, Dr., uh, everybody in China needs to work now because it's like 7.30, yeah. right? <laughs> And in yeah. Brazil, it's you gave really, the uh, close remarks. You, yeah, you in Brazil, it's really late. So it's a pleasure again to have our friends from China, Dr. Yan, Dr. Hu, Dr. Yu, who presented, Dr. Liu, and all the residents that are watching, and also our residents. It was a very great meeting. Uh, thank you again for participating with us. And I hope we can do this again in the future. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This was a very, very, very interesting meeting with very interesting cases. Thank you. Okay, this is a very good uh, presentation and give us uh, four uh, case reports and uh, presentation and good differentiation, good diagnosis and good uh, treatment. And uh, from these four presentations, we have a little more references and uh, in uh, differentiate uh, very difficult case. Very good. I, I, hope, I hope so. In the future, we should have uh, 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 ground rounds uh, Again and again, maybe uh, monthly, maybe monthly. I'm not sure. <laughs> Depend on everybody. Sure. We have every yeah. week. We have every week. Okay. Uh, for we can sure, cover gonna, it together. Yeah, we're gonna put you guys in the schedule for sure. For those of you guys okay. who don't know, Doctor Doctor Yan is chairman and dean of Tianjin yeah. University, and Doctor Hu yeah. is the chairman of yeah. Tia, uh, of Tsinghua uh, University. Tsinghua yeah. University yeah. in yeah. Beijing. In Beijing, so. Yeah. Yeah, they're very good. You know, they're they are, willing to cooperate. Yeah, there are. You know, although it's very, very early in China, in Tianjin, there are so many uh, young residents uh, still online. Okay, no problem. It's very good. Very good. De de yeah, depend on the contents of this uh, presentation. Good. So let's say uh, have to say goodbye. Right. Goodbye. 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 Have a teacher, oh. please. Yeah. Uh, Doctor, you have a teacher, please. Everybody. Oh. Okay. How are you? Victor. One. Victor. Everybody over your uh, camera. Yeah, One, the two, cameras. three. Dr. Yu. You finished, Dr. Yu? Yes, it's done. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you. Okay, bye, bye bye everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Good new friends. Huh? Good new friends. friends. Okay. Rodrigo, see you. See, see you. you. See you, Los Dr. Angeles. Hulu. Yeah, <laughs> bye-bye. Okay.